This episode is brought to you by HighSpots.com. HighSpots.com is the leading provider of professional wrestling and mixed martial arts merchandise. From wrestling boots to wrestling DVDs, wrestling action figures to title belts, HighSpots.com has the largest selection of wrestling merchandise. Go there right now with our link, tinyurl.com slash STS HighSpots. S-T-S-H-I-G-H-S-P-O-T-S. Shop there with that link. It won't cost you any extra, but it will help support this podcast. It's Alan Steele. Hey, it'd be a great companionship to this episode. Here's a clip. Download it. And now, here you go. The clip. We're playing it now. We went out there and had some stuff made, and we started tagging and traveled a little bit. And um, He was kind of, he well, not kind of, he was running... Uh, a company in Dyersburg on Saturday nights. So they'd come in, do TV on Saturday morning, and Saturday night they'd go to Dyersburg, do that show there, and then I think they would drive back on Sundays. And uh, so we started tagging and got kind of, we jailed pretty fast. and It was it was a lot of fun. Picked his brain a lot, and uh, he helped me with uh, my first, uh, booking for WWE, he helped me land that too. So I mean, Mo, Mo has stuck his neck out for me. Um, but I mean, we've done stuff for each other, you know, outside of the wrestling business, right? You know, I know personalized, yeah, and, yeah, you know. Yeah. So I mean, yeah, we we were we were about as tight knit. Um, and I'm not saying that we're not anymore. I just don't see him and get to communicate with him nearly as much as he used to. Uh, but I mean, we were we were like brothers for real, you know. I mean, he stayed at my house before. I mean, anything I needed, all I had to do was pick up the phone. You know, this was there was a brotherhood, like genuine brotherhood between him and myself. Well, I thought, you know, if we were going to talk to you, there's no way I could go 30 minutes without mentioning Sir Mo. I mean, just because right. uh, he was so I, – I always thought he was uh, – uh, I worked for Mo in Dysburg a little bit and did a couple of other mm-hmm. spot shows around, and he was always up front with me and my teams. Um, and always uh, – and I knew he was very important. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Let's start the party. Three live from STS Studios here on a Monday. Wow. Yeah, that's right. On a Monday, guys, I'm trying to get uh, more downloads, more downloads. Really, we've busted last February's record to hell. Uh, but uh, I want to get this episode out early. We got counting today three more days. So if you're listening to this at the end of February, why not go and listen to another episode you never listened to? Uh, let's uh, help us continue to break that February record. I want to give a big shout out and thank you to Bob McGee at Pro Wrestling's Between the Sheets, www.pwbts.com, locals to legends.com. Uh, Gene Jackson and Sean Garmer over at W2Mnet.com. Thank you guys for uh, pushing the show. I do appreciate it. You can join our... um you can join our Cool Kids Wrestling and MMA Talk Facebook group. That's where we actually talk about either the show or we talk about wrestling uh, uh, topics and such. We're not PC, um, and we're not kid-friendly. So you also have to ask to be in a group. If you act like an ass, we kick you out. I have a Shooting the Shiznit Facebook group where I post all of the episodes on. Uh, just search Shooting the Shiznit there in Facebook. Also, at Comic Book Mark BT is uh, my Twitter. I'm at BT Shooting the Shiznit at Instagram. You can get the merch. That's right. Be in the Shiznit shirt is out. TinyURL.com slash STS Pod merch. Uh, PayPal.com is Brian underscore Trammel or Trammel at yahoo.com T-R-A-M-E-L uh I also want to, uh, well, tell you how you can listen to this. If you're listening to it on SoundCloud, it decides you can also listen to it on iTunes, Stitcher, 
Player FM, Pod Paradise, Spreaker. Hey, I want to put over my uh, podcast brothers, uh, Suplex City Limix, JoJo over at Creative Control, Who's Right Podcast, which isn't a wrestling podcast, but it's one of my favorite, P3 Radio, it's wrestling and a little bit of everything else. Uh, also, I want to put over Keeping It 100. I want you guys Keeping It 100 Patreon site is only one dollar. Uh, last night I joined Disco Inferno, Conan, JoJo, Mike Holder, and uh, Michael Young to talk about the Elimination Chamber. We also talked about uh, conspiracy theories, <laughs> uh, a little bit of everything. We actually talked about the Golden Lovers. Uh, like I said, just a lot of fun stuff on that. It's only a dollar, guys. If you like my podcast, it's an hour discussion. Conan joined us, Disco Inferno, JoJo. Uh, just a fantastic, fun day. Uh, that's patreon.com slash Conan. All right, guys, let's get on with the show. Welcome my guest this week, Rude. I got him sitting in the green room. I'm going to bring him on over. Now, Rude is a, let me just say, a tag team master. That's the best way to say it. Uh, and from the Memphis area, if you're listening in the Memphis area, uh, you'll know who Rude is. If you're not, if you're listening from Germany, Australia, hey, we're going to tell you a little bit about Rude, and we're, you're going to enjoy shooting the shiznit today. Hey, Rude, how the hell are you? Man, I am doing wonderful. Wonderful. I'm glad the rain has stopped around here. Good deal. Good deal. Now, uh, me and you've known each other. I always bring people on here I've never talked to before. Uh, me and you've known each other for God. I don't even know. I I, I want to say close to twenty years, but that makes me feel old. So, it, well, uh, well, it's been twenty years for us. It's got to be <laughs> years. Uh, I think I think when I think when I met you, we were still under the mask. You know that's possible. I don't even remember, just barely remember that. And you just, uh, and you just saying that that reminded me that you guys did start under a mask. Uh, I want to start at yes, the sir. front though, before you even started into business. Uh, as a fan, rude. Uh, what were you a fan of, and when did you start being a big wrestling fan? Well, um, one of the things that I remember is every Saturday morning, me and my dad would get up and watch Memphis wrestling. Uh, that was the big thing around in the, uh, I live in the, uh, Jackson, Tennessee area. So that was one, the, that was one of the, the only wrestling companies that was on TV at the time. And, uh, every night in WWF would air Saturday night main event, but every Saturday morning we would watch Memphis wrestling, um, Jerry Lawler, Bill Dundee, Austin Idol, Henson Jimmy, Joe LaDuke. Billy Joe Travis, Brian Christopher, Spellbinder, and the list goes on. I, I grew up watching all those guys, Rock and Roll Express, uh, you know, all those guys. I, I remember watching Jeff Jarrett when he was just a, a skinny referee. Now he's <laughs> going into the WWE Hall of Fame. Yeah, I know. That's I mean, that's the thing about it, and I've tried to explain it to people outside the Memphis area. If you grew up uh, in that area and watched Memphis wrestling, it was um, – it was – it was just part of the culture. I mean, on the on the playground uh, with your friends, everyone wasn't you know running around trying to be anything but wrestlers. They wanted to. I'll, I'm Jerry Lawler today, or I'm you know. There was always you're going to be someone that day, and it was it was uh, because of Memphis wrestling, and uh, and so you, big Memphis wrestling fan. WWE. Uh, who was growing up? Who was your favorite wrestler? Actually, it was a toss-up between Jerry Lawler, Bill Dundee, and Austin Idol and Henson Jimmy. Well, I, I liked all, and, and actually, actually, when Coco Ware did the Stagger League gimmick, um, that was that he was my favorite at that time when he was doing the Stagger League. Gimmick. 
Right, right. Yeah, you started seeing a little bit uh, a different Coco Ware at that time, uh, uh, and he came came in his own during that time. So we watched wrestling. We're a huge fan, and uh, I don't even. I'm asking you questions. I don't know the answers to, even though we've known each other forever, uh, or can't remember. That's that's a good thing about me. I forget stuff. Uh, who now? You decide to get into the business. Now, who trained you, and how did we start doing that? All right. Well, this is. Really, everybody thinks that uh, me and Tully just uh, hooked up and started tagging. Actually, me and Tully are uh, best friends, uh, grew up together, graduated from a classmate, played high school football together, and he was the other wrestling fan that, that I connected with. Uh, all my other buddies and everything, they they would watch it every now and then, but I could, I could depend on Tully catching every show that I called, uh, used to go over to his house and watch the old WCW pay-per-views, uh, well, NWA, you know, the Great American Bash and Halloween Havoc and all that stuff. And, uh, so Tully called me one day and he said, Hey man, I'm at work. I got this guy that, uh, that's a wrestler and he's willing to train us. And I remember that conversation like it was yesterday. And I said, I'm in if you're, if we're going to go all out and try to beat somebody. And he said, let's do it. So um, I know there's a lot of stories about us uh, when we first got in the business, how we were real stiff and was trying to hurt people. <laughs> Believe it or not, we started bumping in the front yard uh, at Tim White's house. Uh, and Tim White had this guy named Wild Bill that was his actual uh, physical, that did the physical stuff with us. Right. And uh, we bumped, we bumped in the, we bumped out the front yard, learned how to bump in Tim White's front yard, and then we moved to, um, I want to say it was South Fulton, Kentucky, to this guy Chris Anthony that had a ring set up in his backyard, and we would drive up there three times a week uh, and work out in the ring, and. Uh, Wild Bill and Chris Anthony was like, man, y'all are just too physical for us. I mean, seriously, that's what they said. So me and Tully would drive up there, and we would just go over what we knew in the ring. Well, Chris Anthony also owned uh, a company that was running in Huntington, and he wanted us to uh, wrestle there. So when we got our stuff in and everything, and he booked us, and our first night that we ever had a match, we won tag team straps. Imagine that. <laughs> now, <laughs> were y'all naughty by nature the then? You mentioned the hoods, yes. but y'all were yes, naughty we, by nature. Yes, we've the... always been naughty by nature. Wow. Yeah, so that's... Now? Go ahead. Um, yeah, we were always naughty by nature, but we were under mask in our first match. Oh, I guess I we lost won all oh, American tag team belts. Wow! Did I mean that? Uh, um, do you? What do you remember about the first match? Because I, I, the first match I ever had. I mean, I totally suck, but but the first match that I ever had, I remember just small details. But what's the big thing you remember? I remember that um, I was thinking that everybody must think there's a sewage problem somewhere because we were stinking up the place. <laughs> You weren't that bad, were you? <laughs> oh gosh, we were horrible. We were horrible, and and I was like, I don't know why, how, but I'm not going to complain. But I just knew when I look out in the crowd, people had their nose. If, if I felt like people had their nose turned up because it was stinking up the place so bad, we were we were stinking it up bad. <laughs> and the guys that we were working wasn't that great either, so I knew that we was going to have a sewage back up somewhere. <laughs> I do. I remember, um, and I asked this to Alan. At what point? I mean, when you guys said I want to be trained, did, were they upfront and honest with you guys and said, "Hey, it's a work. This we got to work with each other." Blah blah blah. Or, or sooner than that, when you was a fan, did you? I always felt like I knew it was a work, but I didn't know how it was being worked. So I didn't have a problem with it. I just knew I didn't know how they did it, kind of thing. But were these guys up front with you guys just? At, Oh, okay. Oh, no. Oh, oh no. really? I, I, no, because as a fan, wrestling was real. 
Especially was real when I found out what the, 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 the when I started training and everything, I was hot. I was mad because I'm like, wait a minute, I've been betrayed all this time, but I, I still loved it. Right. Oh yeah, it and didn't so, bother my love of it any to know what how it was done. It did actually. I think I become more of a fan and, and wanted to be involved since I understood, uh, you know, what it took to for one move to do the other, and you know, in the storylines and such as that. Uh, you guys debuted one tag team belts uh, uh, and uh, had the mask on. And what did y'all? I mean, in Naughty by Nature starting out. Why Naughty by Nature? Was it because of the group was so hot at that time, or why was Naughty by Nature? Well, actually, we had we we were there was a and because me and Tully loves music, we love rap music, so we were tossing names around, and it was either crucial conflict or naughty by nature, and uh, uh, we chose to go with naughty by nature. And when we first started wrestling, you know, we would always call ourselves naughty by nature, not the rap group, but the wrestling. Right, right. And so people wouldn't get, you know, and then some people were like, oh, y'all going to get sued and everything. And 23 years later, I haven't heard from Trish or any of them, so... I guess we're good. <laughs> right on. I, that was my next question. I wondered if they, uh, I remember, you know, seeing the name and everything. The weird thing is that, that, uh, when we met was not because I had went to wrestling and, you know, watched you guys or anything. It was because we were on the same car together. Uh, and I was managing a team is the reason, uh, um, that we had met together. Now you, you, how did you lose a mask? Did you lose a mask in a match? And then you went from, t- and people that don't know this team, that it was rude and totally at first, and then involved into Poker Face uh, with Naughty by Nature. But how did all that happen? How did, uh, and we've seen a lot of you and Poker together for a long time, and I can remember some Tully and Poker also, but what happened to the mask, and how did it evolve into a three man team? Well, um, like Alan was telling in his, uh, in his interview, uh, Alan was one of the ones that was training up on the field out there. And me, Derek King, Lance Cade, Lance Jade, I'm sorry, Lance Jade, and there was one other one, I can't remember, were the quote unquote teachers. And Bill Dundee would get on to me about, you need to come out of that mask, you need to come out of that mask, facial expression, sales. And so one, and so I, I kept pressure and Tully about it, and he kept telling me, no, 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 no. And here's the thing, and the, and, and the story behind the reason why we wore masks is because we didn't want our foreheads looking like all the old timers from where they were juicing. <laughs> so, and so we chose black masks because it would be dumb for somebody to make us juice under a mask in a black mask, and the blood is dark, and you ain't going to see the blood. So that's why we chose the black mask. But anyway, I finally convinced Tully to uh, come out of the mask. And one night after the after a match, we just decided, hey, this is the night. I mean, the spur of the moment, this is the night. We're going to take them off. So we unmasked ourselves. And the, the, the fans went wild because they seen these two um, nice-looking black men that were very athletic and entertaining, and now they get to see their face. So, I mean, it was it was a... It was a new beginning, but it was it was. I was glad to get out of those hot things too. Right. But, uh, and how poker face, how poker face came along was we were we were doing shows for WWF NWA Mid South, and it seemed like every week uh, they would have us go out and help poker win the match, and then in our tag match they would always have poker come out and help us win our match. So one night, uh, me and Tully was riding home from Guy's brother, and I said, you know, dude, we're always helping poker. He's always helping us. Why don't we add him? Why don't we add that third member? And Tully said, are you serious? And I go, yes, let's add him. He said, well, you got a point. I said, all right, so I'm going to call him now. So I called Poker Face up, and I said, man, have you ever thought about becoming a member of Naughty by Nature? And he was like, are you serious? And I said, very serious. And he was like, hell yeah. So there we were. There we were. And, you know, we added him. And he was a single guy. Um, and uh, 
uh, he would manage us, uh, tag managers, and everything just started clicking uh, because we would hang out together and we never took any crap. When we were, we used to go to the clubs all the time and when one was fighting, all of us was fighting. If one had a problem, we all had a problem. If one pulled a pistol, the other pulled a pistol. So we was, you know, I used, I tell people all the time, not in my nature, it's not a gimmick, it's a way of life for us. Because one for all, all for one. And I mean, we just clicked on the road. Uh, I handled the bookings. Uh, Uncle handled the rental car. Uh, Charlie handled the other odds and ends. Uh, uh, you know, he would figure out, you know, what, what everybody uh, part of the price was going to be on the rental car, gas going to and from. And, you know, we everybody had their role. So um, about you seeing me and poker tagging, Tully and poker tagging, uh, Charlie got a new job and he was working uh, second shift, so he couldn't work. He would he couldn't work at that time. So me and Tully uh, Poker would tag, and then when you would see Tully and Poker tagging, is because I'm a high school basketball official or football official, and right. when I couldn't make a show because I had a game, they would tag. So that's how the the mixture and it was. We were almost we were your modern day fabulous, fabulous freebird. Where if we had a tag team, if we had tag team straps, any three of us could defend those. So that's basically where that where that concept comes from. Right, and right. it worked. It did. It, you guys were over either as heels or babies, and uh, you know you had people wanting to kill you at times. And then uh, I remember being in Mid South, and there was a section of guys that would always chant something. I can't remember exactly. Maybe it was something you guys would say on your interview, but they would do the exact thing when y'all were talking it was just uh i was like man these guys are over okay we're gonna take a quick uh uh commercial break here and i'll be right back well, i want to talk about you working for wwe and some later stuff you did so here we go NFLShop.com is the official online store for the National Football League. It offers the biggest selection of officially licensed NFL merchandise online. Shoppers looking for jerseys, the game day collection apparel by Nike, and headwear from View Era will find what they want from all 32 teams at NFLShop.com. The season may be over, but you can still get all of your division winning shirts as well as Super Bowl apparel right now if you go there visiting them with our link, tinyurl.com. Slash STS NFL shop STS NFL SHOP shopping there with this link will cost you nothing extra but will help support this podcast. Now, back to the show. All right, we're back with Rude. Rude, now you uh got some shots there working uh WWE on television. How did that come about? Who got you actually those uh those spots working for WWE? Well, um, I used to get a lot of uh, when 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 WWE would come to Memphis, Derek King would always call me and go, "Hey, what are you doing? Uh, they need some extra bodies at WWE." You know, like I'm on my way. I'm telling my boss right now, I'm taking the rest of the day off. I'm on my way. So uh, Derek was responsible for the ones in Memphis. Uh, the, the, the television appearance that I made uh, on Sunday night, he uh, tagging with uh, Alan Steele. Um, I listened to Alan Steele's. Uh, interview and this is the this is the true story behind that the true story behind that was the, the original booking was alan Steele and john michaels okay um sermo called me and he said rude if i gave you a wwe booking the date and everything and where you're supposed to be at would you forget and i said hell no i wouldn't forget that he said, good, here's the two dates right here. He said, it's you and Island Steel going to Huntsville, Alabama and Birmingham, Alabama. I said, cool. And uh, that's how that came about is actually it was John Michael and supposed to John Michael either, I took it as John Michael either chickened out or, or legitimately forgot. But anyway, right. uh, I don't know if him and Mo had words. I don't know. I, I didn't care. I wasn't gonna miss my 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 time my my opportunity. Uh, John Cena, my time is now. I took it, and um, so I called Poker and I said, uh, "Poker face, um, Mo just called me, and uh, me and Alan Steele are going to Birmingham, Alabama, and uh, Huntsville, Alabama on such and such 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 a date." And he said, "For real?" And I go, "Yeah." 
I want to go. We'll take my car. <laughs> Hell, I'll drive. And I said, cool. So I called Alan and I said, look, Mo just called me. He said, yeah, I know. And I said, well, I just talked to Poker Face. And Poker Face said that he would drive. He would take off. He, we could take his car. And he started laughing. He said, cool. So I get in my car. I drive to Memphis. I get with Poker. We get together. We go to, uh, um, I forgot exactly where Alan was living at the town. We pick Alan still up. And here, we, here, we, here the three of us off on our way to, uh, I can't remember which one was first, but uh, here we are headed to Alabama to do these two dates for WWE. We get there, and um, I remember it like it was yesterday. We're sitting in the locker room, and uh, Sergeant Slaughter came in, comes in, and he goes, uh, well, uh, we got a problem. We're short a guy, and I said, uh, Sarge, uh, he's a worker, and I point that poker face. He said, you got your gear? And Poker's like, uh, yes, sir. And he said, well, get dressed. You're on. And Poker... Uh, Poker's not even supposed to be here. He don't even, he don't even supposed to be here. Right. And he works both days with us. Awesome. Now awesome. the second day I did. Now the second day at uh, uh, SmackDown Velocity, um, I didn't work, um, and I'm kind of glad I didn't work because I was a little sore. Uh, we had worked out or something, and I'm still about killed me, and I was very sore. And uh, uh, but. Poker face worked both shows and uh, when he was supposed to be there, you know, and I thought, you know, this is just, he took a, he took a chance when a lot of these guys these days don't know anything about, he made a sacrifice and it paid off for him, you know, so, and, you know, he went on to do other stuff. He was one of the uh, Undertaker, uh, I forgot what you call the guys that held the planes and the, right, right, and the yeah. little hoodies and everything. He got to do all that. You know, he ended up doing the deal with Peter the Entertainer and Danny B, Dustin Starr, and all that. They've called him for, you know, different stuff. And that's how it started for him because he took that chance. And a lot of guys don't understand about chance, but you have sometimes you have to make a sacrifice and just go out and go, hey, I'm going to take this chance. And he did that and it paid off for him. Um, that Tuesday and um, that Tuesday when we were at SmackDown, it was a it was a totally different atmosphere versus uh, being at Raw, and um, being at SmackDown, I thought, man, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to chase this dream anymore. Poker Face would call me and go, "Hey, SmackDown, I mean, uh, Raw is coming to uh, Little Rock, Arkansas. Send your send your uh, package in." I said, "Okay," and I wouldn't do it. Because I didn't, I didn't want to chase that dream anymore. That 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 night at SmackDown, I I kind of gave up on my dream. What made it was it, just did you give it up? Night. Um, the the attitudes, the attitudes. Uh, there were people that were riding other people coattails, um, and were we were sitting at catering and uh, Mick, what was it Mick Tierney and um, uh, Heinrich. Hundred, you know the guy that did right, the yeah, deal yeah. on. Uh, they was watching. They had worked a dark match at Monday Night Raw, and they was we were sitting at the table watching a match. And one of the guys come up and he was like, "What is what? Is, what is this garbage? What is?" And I'm thinking, "Who are you? You riding somebody else's coattail?" I mean, the egos, the egos, and the and the, I mean, the attitudes in the locker room from SmackDown to Raw were just too different. It was like night and day. I enjoyed myself at Raw. Uh, I enjoyed myself at SmackDown being around the old heads like the Benoit's and the Malenko's and Rey Mysterio and all of them, Kurt Angle. But, you know, th those younger guys that were, were trying to, you know, they were still trying to establish their name under the, at, at the WWE and they were being real buttholes about it. So I was like, no, because I know me and my attitude. So I, I, I told Alan in poker, I won't be here no more. So I mean, that's, that's a I part of the business, you, and you know that. And it, that's the part that if you don't like it, you can't you can't be around it. And, and apparently it's changed a little bit. But, uh, uh, you know, I always felt that no matter – at other places. Even Memphis was like that to a certain degree for me. Uh, I didn't work Memphis television, but if you were there on a show with one of the, you know, the major Memphis guys – uh, you got kind of that attitude. 
Uh, I want to talk about you went to Memphis. Uh, do you, did you, you work? Did you ever work? I don't remember this, but did you guys ever work? You know, just jobs on Memphis television, or was it y'all had your first run as the clowns? Um. Okay, so me and Tully before we had poker, um, uh, I called. I said, uh, Tully, what about Miss Stress? And he said, Well, see what you can do. So I made the phone call to Memphis TV, talked to Guy Coffee. Guy Coffee said, be here at 7 o'clock, uh, 8 o'clock, Saturday morning. I think the show started at 11. Now we have to be there at 7 o'clock. Right. And I said, okay. I get off the phone with Guy Coffee. I call uh, Tully back, and I tell him we got to be there at 7 o'clock in the morning. He said, okay. So we get up at 5, 4.30, and we hit the road at 4.45. We're headed to Memphis, and I'm telling you, it is raining cats and dogs, not like how the storm was last month. Right. Uh, we're driving to Memphis TV. We get to Memphis TV, we, we come in through this door, we ask for guy coffee. He finally comes after having us sit out there for two hours, and uh, he said, well, guys, we ain't got nothing for you to do today, but, you know, you can go watch the show, uh, sit out in the crowd, watch the show, and uh, come back next week, I'll have something for you. I said, okay. And he walked off and I said, tell me, I ain't coming back. <laughs> we ain't drove in the store risking our lives and I ain't coming back. So we never, we, we, we gave that up then. But then, uh, Poker Face, Lola called Poker Face and said, hey, I got this gimmick I want done. I want you and Alan Steele to do it. And Poker Face was like, no disrespect to Alan, but I have a tag team partner that I think it'll work better with. Can we use him? And Lawler said, can he work? And then Lawler didn't, um, when Poker told him who I was, and, and, and Lawler remembered me from when they were doing their Memphis taping in Dyersburg, um, he was like, oh, yeah. So they called me, and, and you know, and I agreed. And that's when we, that's when we come, you know, was on Memphis TV as the clowns. And right. he gave us full control over it. And a lot of people thought that we would fail with that gimmick. But actually, we made that gimmick our own. and. I thought it got over well. We did a lot of stuff that a lot of people think thought we couldn't pull off. Yep, we pulled it off. I agree. I, you know, me and you, uh, and I want to ask you, because I, we shook hands since since that happened uh, and, and been nice to each other. <laughs> but you were really, <laughs> you was really pissed at me, brother. You was pissed at me because uh, – uh, I, I I don't really know. Was it because I revealed who the clowns were, or was it because I was I was a naughty by nature fan? I mean, let me just put it. That's why I I posted what I did. I was pissed that they weren't using naughty by nature and using you guys under clown. Now now, did you own it? Did y'all do a good job? Hell yeah, y'all did. But at the point to when y'all was first come out, I was pissed. I was pissed at management, and, and that's what my – I mean, I did it for five years, a website, and that was, you know, if I was criticizing, I was criticizing management. But, buddy, you was pissed at me, so tell me why you was pissed at me. Because you revealed who we were. Oh, okay. You revealed who the clowns were. And we were trying to keep it a secret, and uh, we were trying – we were – Actually, we were trying to think. We were trying to see how long it would take for for the fans to realize who we were. Do you and know when you this, revealed it, not, not, right? Here's the crazy that? thing about that: is that everyone, even Corey Macklin at the time, suspected that I was talking to someone in the back. <laughs> I was yeah. actually talking to a fan at the time who who was a little kid. I can't even remember his name. He was. 14 or 15 years old, he sat in the mm -hmm. crowd at Memphis for the tapings, and he actually uh, called me, because I don't think I was a Texan at the time, he called me and uh -huh. said, Naughty by Nature's under the clown mask. <laughs> <laughs> he knew by the way y'all worked. He knew just who y'all were. He was so smart. And I can't remember. He's probably a wrestler now, but but I can't remember what the kid's name was. I got a serious question to ask you because you, you're one of those guys that, to me, there's there's never been uh, a black and white issue with you. Uh, and right. you and, and me, uh, we probably never talked about this, but, but I seriously think it's because, uh, number one, it, it starts with our you know, with us, and then 
uh, you know, I'll just come out and say my dad was a huge racist, uh, and I tried my best not to be like my dad on that part. My dad, one of the sweetest guys in the world, but he was a racist. Um, right. But, but, uh, and, and uh, but you've never, I've never seen that with you, but did you see that as you being, like you said earlier, a black, a black stud coming out from under the mask? <laughs> did you ever see that pressure? Do you think, um, do you think uh, you didn't get a push because you weren't because you weren't white, or did you ever see people say, you know, did they scream and yell the N word at you and stuff like that? Um. Well, the only time I've ever been called the N word was when I was in uh, Mississippi. Um, I went down, totally couldn't go on a show. Uh, I think it was a uh, uh, Mike Grimes show and. Uh, Sotillo, Mississippi, I think, or either Tupelo or somewhere right around just past course, Mississippi. And uh, the only time I've ever been called the N-word is uh, this, I was a heel under mask, and this guy said something to me, and I said something to the to the, uh, the, the, the fact of um, your, your wife there wasn't saying that last night when right. I had her in bed <laughs> or something like that, and I remember getting a whole escort to the state line and the Tennessee state troopers waiting on me and make this guy, cause they were following me. They were ready to kill me. They were ready to kill me. They was like that, you know, we're going to kill this N word and, and, and all this. And then they called them. I mean, good old boys. I mean, they were, they were going, they were going to kill me. That was, this was before I started carrying protection. Right. So I, yeah, was I a little nervous that night? Yes, I would. I by myself in Mississippi, and I mean, I literally drove by myself down there. So yeah, I was scared. Uh, far as uh, not getting a push because of my skin color, you know, and believe it or not, um, at some points um, I thought that may have been the case, but we were so talented, and, and we made so much noise in the ring that it couldn't be overlooked. So they couldn't ignore the fact of giving us our, our, our due, you know, pushes and all that. I think, our, I think what we did in the ring spoke volumes where it couldn't be overlooked by management. So, um, I, I don't, I don't never, I don't think that that was ever a problem with us. I never, I, I never thought it was, uh, uh, I've always thought that, you know, when we got in the ring and no matter you know, they said Ric Flair could have a match with a broomstick and, and put the broomstick over and make him look like a million bucks. I think Naughty by Nature was one of the best tag teams on the independent scene that probably could have a tag team match with two broomsticks and make it entertaining and put them over and make them look like a million bucks. Right. And I think that's where we got our pushes because our, our in-ring stuff spoke so much that promoters and the bookers couldn't overlook us. Right. Oh, I agree. And I think that, yeah, I, I think that was part of it. And I, you know, I never, I, I try my best never to see color, you know, and I was going to be a school teacher. That's one of those things where you, you just can. And then, like I said, growing up with my dad, uh, but we never said, oh, we're going to, you know, we're going to go wrestle that black tag team. That was never coming out. I want to give you credit. Right. You helped uh, two of my guys. We were wrestling as, uh, they were wrestling as Sex and Candy at the time. And uh, uh, Chris and Jacobs that. are probably wrestling. And we, um, we were sitting in the crowd this night. I want to tell this story because you guys were super about this. Uh, uh, you came, you told us to come to the back. We went around the back. We didn't even go to the dresser. We went into the back and you said, uh, uh, I want you guys to jump us, leave us laying, and then we're going to be gone for X amount of weeks, and y'all do whatever you want to do. And then we'll come back and we'll feud with y'all. And we was like, we're all in for it. So we jump you guys, beat you up, leave you laying, and then we made this spoof of Naughty by Nature <laughs> yeah. for weeks. Yeah. And... And they were like, man, Rude and Tully's going to be pissed at y'all. Man, they're going to be mad at y'all. They're going to be mad for real. And I think, if I remember right, y'all were going to Chicago at the time. Um, yes, we were. And y'all came back. We were in the ring making fun of y'all again. And y'all came back. And you stiff motherfuckers hit us hard. I mean, I, <laughs> I sold it because I had to. Um and I and, uh, rode out of the ring. My guys rode out of the ring. And I, I remember saying to them guys, man, I think they're pissed for real. 
And uh, so we come backstage, and y'all, and I actually had a tape for you and gave it to you. And uh, y'all were all game for it. Y'all was have y'all thought it was hilarious and thought it was awesome. Uh, but because y'all had came back from Chicago, y'all were stiff. So we thought maybe y'all were pissed at us. So, uh, and, and also, I'm gonna tell you what. My- Going to Chicago made us stiff because I'm telling you right now, this is a stiff guy. But you, you had no choice. You had to hit back <laughs> we, or we just got, get hit, huh? <laughs> right, right, right. We what, gave out a lot of receipts in Chicago. You right, right. And then was it you in poker or were you in total? I don't remember. We worked. Uh, you were total chaos. It was just tremendous. What I can't remember what the two of the three team was, but we ran the. You know where you you run a single match, the first match, single match, the second match. We interfere, blah blah blah, and then y'all challenged us for a tag uh, for Gary White and them. Uh, was that you? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Oh that was God. Me. That was a hell of a match right that. there, yeah. Right. Um, now, you, you're talking about everything that you remember. I do remember this. I remember giving you, me and Tony giving you a 3D. Oh, you my God. You remember that? Yes. You remember that? You know, I thought you broke my collarbone. You yes, you that? told me it was fine. You kept saying, oh, no, no, that was good. That was good. You never would tell me that I fucked that move up. And, uh, man, you come down on my collarbone. And I thought I broke it. I thought you broke my collarbone. My shoulder hurt me so bad, so bad. But it felt, it looked good, and so I was just going with it. Y'all, man, you're I'm fine. Everything was good. <laughs> no, dude, in, inside I was crying, bawling because my shoulder was hurting so bad. I remember that. I remember. I, do you, you, you told do me you years remember, later. Do you remember that three D yeah. we gave you? Yeah, what? that hurt. Yeah, <laughs> I just yeah. want to let you know. I'm going to go to record. It hurt. <laughs> <laughs> well, you eventually told me that. You that. Yeah. <laughs> but that I time, lied to you that night because it hurt. You did. You said, oh, no, that was good. I thought it felt horrible. It felt, you know, you know, when you do something in the ring and it feels good, you kind of say, well, it went good. When I did it, I didn't feel like I jumped, you know, right or did anything right. And then I, when I came back, you said, no, no, everything's all right. And and then later on, I think uh, it was a couple of months later, you eventually said, man, I, th- I, th- I don't think I thought it was your collarbone. I thought it was a rib, but I knew I had, you thought I'd broke something. So I do apologize for that. Yeah, I didn't get up. A fat boy didn't get up. Problem. So. <laughs> No, you got up. You got up and just uh, uh, your your left arm, instead of putting it up under me, you put it on top of me. And when we came down, you came down and you planted right your, your forearm right on my collarbone. And I thought, oh, my God, it's broke. Right, right. Yeah, that was crazy. That's crazy. Fun times, though. Guys, I, hey, I want to thank you for coming on. Uh, uh, rude, and I'm having a hard time calling you rude because I always call you by your shoot name <laughs> in the back. Right, so yep. uh, I do appreciate right. you coming on. It, it's been fun, man. Uh, uh, and we was able to reminisce, guys. I hope y'all enjoyed it. Uh, thank the listeners for downloading. Uh, uh, thank our sponsors, as you heard the commercials before and during the show. And uh, join us next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. The best little wrestling podcast in the business. Be there. Love my mama. Hey, man. <laughs>